welcome once again dear friends today we are discussing many topics uh, of the uh, diabetics related topic uh, and this is the to in these sessions we are going to discuss the insulin therapy as you are uh, aware that diabetes is the one of the major problem in our day to day life because the incidence of the diabetes is increasing globally and especially in the indian subcontinental and the management of the diabetes is very much important not only the uh, non pharmacological treatment like exercise diet control and there are lot of pharmacological uh, agents are available to control the uh, hyperglycemic state but the insulin is the one of the key uh, role which is uh, which is going to play to the management of the diabetes mellitus and today to discuss the insulin therapy we are having dr sudhir uh, he is next to me and he is the consultant in endocrinologist uh, in gangaram hospital and he is going to describe the importance of the insulin therapy how it is going to conduct and what are the different complication and what are the titer and all this issue he is going to describe so i would like to request dr sudhir please continue with this uh, topic good evening uh, ladies and gentlemen uh, this evening uh, we shall be discussing insulin therapy in the treatment predominantly of type 2 diabetes as you know there are two types of diabetes predominantly one is type 1 diabetes and the other is the maturity onset diabetes which is called type 2 diabetes so insulin therapy is one of the modes of treatment of uh, diabetes and uh, apart from diet and exercise and oral antidiabetic agents so we shall uh, discuss the role of insulin in the treatment of diabetes dominantly type 2 diabetes but also in type 1 diabetes so i shall begin the talk with uh, uh with the list of the following subheadings uh, uh, in which we are going to discuss uh, diabetes one is the history of insulin uh the second is a rationale for insulin therapy third is uh, something regarding human insulins then we shall discuss a few uh, slides on modern insulin therapy which is the use of modern insulins and then insulin regimens and insulin administration practical tips and uh, guidelines coming to the history of insulin we all know that insulin was discovered or isolated in 1921 by frederick banting and charles best they had isolated insulin from the pancreas of dogs and they showed that insulin from dog pancreas lowered blood glucose this was the first time that this was demonstrated that a substance secreted from the pancreas could lower blood glucose in patients or in patients with diabetes or high blood sugar levels this slide here shows a photograph of uh, frederick banting and charles best uh, they were the two people the two gentlemen who discovered uh, insulin in 1921 following experiments in the university of toronto and they announced this this discovery to the world on 30th july 1921 and in the center of this photograph you see see the dog in which the experiments were carried out now this slide also is talking something about the discovery of insulin the people who were involved on the right slide of the slide are charles best and frederick banting who discovered insulin and on the left part of the slide is uh, j j r macleod and j b collip j j r macleod was a gentleman in whose laboratory in the university of toronto the experiments were carried out and j b collip was a bio biochemist uh, who was responsible for um, for uh, refining the the extract of insulin from the pancreas of dogs and in the center of the slide one can see the initial vials of insulin which were first made by uh, by the company called novo nordisk Uh, going ahead with the discovery of insulin the first patient to receive a pancreatic extract of insulin was a 14 year old boy suffering from type 1 diabetes called leonard thompson and he was the first patient to benefit from insulin and it saved him from death he of course lived from the year 1908 to 1935 after having used insulin in 1921 he survived for roughly um uh, 14 years on insulin therapy and of course succumbed to his illness in due course of time Coming now to the structure of insulin as you can see insulin has two chains an alpha chain and a beta chain and uh, the alpha chain has 21 amino acids and the beta chain has 30 amino acids and they are linked by dis disulfide bridges and uh, the various molecules the various amino acids 
in the insulin molecule are responsible for different functions some are is responsible for uh, receptor uh, binding some ha are responsible for uh, other functions of insulin the insulin molecule and there are certain amino acids which can be modified resulting in the discovery of the insulin analogs to which we shall allude to during the latter part of the talk now novo nordisk has been on the forefront of uh, the various insulin developments and the next two slides uh, show that in 1922 insulin was first isolated and 1923 production of insulin was begun uh, nph insulin or neutral protamine hackdon insulin the old time intermediate acting insulin which is still available of course uh, in the human form was uh, discovered in 1946 and in 1961 the first neutral soluble insulin called actrapid was discovered what was in earlier years known as regular insulin and the first premixed insulin called mixtard was uh, discovered in the year 1964 or developed in the year 1964 in 1973 mono component purity insulin the purer forms of insulins were uh, discovered and in uh, 1982 the human mono component insulin was first discovered as you are well aware the insulin were originally obtained from uh, from cattle so it was called bovine insulin subsequently purer forms of insulin were made available from pigs that was called porcine insulin and in 1982 for the first time human insulin was discovered by recombinant dna technology and in 1984 uh, knowing the uh, the drawbacks of the regular human insulin and the bovine and porcine insulins research on analogs began and um, the first insulin pen the novo pen with a pen fill cartridge was available in 1985 and thereafter rapid advances have taken place in the development of various forms of newer insulins and newer insulin delivery devices what is the rationale for insulin therapy We all know that insulin is a polypeptide hormone which is produced by the beta cells in the islets of Langerhans in the pancreas. It has profound effects on both uh, carbohydrate, fat and protein metabolism and to some extent on water and electrolyte balance. Insulin deficiency is what causes diabetes and it leads to elevated plasma glucose which is referred to as hyperglycemia. It also causes elevation in plasma lipids especially triglycerides referred to as hypertriglyceridemia and altered protein metabolism leading to metabolic and immune defects. Now insulin replacement in diabetes tends to restore normalcy in the metabolism of carbohydrates lipids as well as proteins. Insulin is the definitive answer for the treatment of diabetes particularly type 1 and sometimes in type 2 diabetes and it is the most powerful agent to control blood sugar levels in all types of diabetes. The actions of insulin uh, revolve around an integrated action on carbohydrate, protein, and fat metabolism. The dominant effect on glucose homeostasis is predominantly exerted in three tissues of the body: the liver, the skeletal muscle, and the fat. All three tissues are important sites for the action of insulin, controlling the metabolism of carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. We all know that in the liver, insulin inhibits glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. thus lowering blood sugar production or re reducing hepatic glucose output it stimulates glycogenesis and storage of glycogen in the liver in skeletal muscle and adipocytes the peripheral tissues so to say the insulin molecule causes stimulation of glucose uptake utilization and storage and it increases glucose transport in these peripheral tissues thus by a dual mechanism acting on the liver and on the peripheral tissues it causes reduction in blood glucose levels So in other words insulin increases glucose uptake in muscle liver and adipose tissue it suppresses glucose output from the liver it increases formation of fat preventing lipolysis it inhibits breakdown of fats and promotes amino acid uptake and prevents protein breakdown Now coming to the secretion of insulin in a normal healthy person we know that insulin is secreted uh, throughout the day over 24 hour period in the form of boluses as well as in the form of a basal insulin as you can see on this slide here the boluses of insulin are secreted in response to a meal three times a day or four times a day depending on the number of times one eats a meal and in the interprandial period or between meals there is a basal secretion of insulin which constantly regulates the blood sugar levels particularly at night which suppresses hepatic glucose output
So insulin in the body is secreted in the forms of boluses as well as basal insulin which is secreted 24 hours round the clock. And the meal related boluses of insulin are secreted in the first phase and a second phase insulin response in response to a meal particularly glucose intake. Now what are the indications for insulin therapy? The most obvious answer to that is type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is the uh, is a disease which is treated only by insulin where oral anti-diabetic agents have no role to play. Women with diabetes who become pregnant or are breastfeeding, uh, especially pre-gestational diabetics who become pregnant or uh, patients who develop uh, gestational diabetes mellitus are treated with insulin. Of course, there is a, a role for oral medication in the treatment of some forms of diabetes, uh, but it's a new area and uh, it's not uh, recognized or FDA approved uh, the use of oral agents in the treatment of gestational diabetes. In the treatment of type 2 diabetes, insulin plays a special role in certain special situations such as those with renal and hepatic disease, pancreatitis, hyperosmolar state or HHS, during surgery, perioperative preparation for patients with type 2 diabetes, during acute infections, sepsis, etc. And of course, in type 2 diabetes, insulin plays an important role in inadequately controlled patients on oral anti-diabetic drugs. What does insulin therapy do, whether it is type 1 or type 2 diabetes? Insulin therapy aims to replicate the normal physiological insulin response. Insulin regimens should be individualized with types of diabetes, the willingness to inject a lifestyle, blood glucose monitoring, age, dexterity of the fingers and the hands, and glycemic targets. Before we go on to the various modalities and the various types of insulins that are available, I would like to talk about the global targets for glycemic control. Uh, as we are well aware, the ADA, uh, the American Diabetes Association and the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists have set targets for blood glucose control. HbA1c or glycosylated hemoglobin less than 7% as far as the ADA is concerned and less than 6.5% as far as the ACE con is concerned is a target for bl uh, chronic blood glucose control. Fasting blood glucose levels of 90 to 130 and now it is suggested that levels of fasting glucose less than 110 are ideal for most patients with diabetes. Of course, it has to be tempered with the age of the patient and the presence of coexisting renal or hepatic abnormalities. And a post-prandial blood glucose level of less than 180 uh, as suggested by the ADA and less than 140 as suggested by the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. So these are the targets for blood glucose control in any patient with type 2 or type 1 diabetes. The HbA1c goal is the most important goal and the ADA in 2007 suggested that A1c goal for the individual patient is an HbA1c as close to normal, the normal being defined as a level of less than 6%, so as close to normal as possible without significant hypoglycemia. That should be the target of treatment. Now, this slide demonstrates the natural history in the case of type 2 diabetes. As you can see in the lower panel of the slide, in the blue line is demonstrated the uh, the predominant role that insulin resistance plays in the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes. And you can see that as the insulin secretion copes up, the patient does not develop diabetes. But when in the yellow line, we see the insulin levels or uh, insulin secretion falling off, that is when clinical diabetes develops and post meal glucose and fasting glucose start rising. So the insulin resistance remains at a constant level throughout the natural history of the disease and doesn't change very much. But as the insulin secretion declines, the blood glucose levels tends to go up. And depending on this natural history, the various types of treatment uh, are modulated around this natural history of the disease. As you can see, the medical, treat medical nutrition treatment and exercise play an important role throughout the natural history of the disease. But particularly in the early stages in what is known as pre-diabetes, when the blood glucose levels are rising before they actually develop diabetes, medical nutrition therapy and exercise play an important role. As time goes by, the use of oral anti-diabetic agents or secretagogues, insulin secretagogues, or for that matter, metformin and thiazolidine dions play an important role. But once these agents fail to work, insulin is, is the pr prime treatment for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. So most individuals with type 2 diabetes will eventually require insulin therapy because 
as we shall shall see in the next couple of slides oral agents are not entirely successful in the treatment of type 2 diabetes in this study here uh, it's demonstrated that with the use of metformin alone or with sulfonylurea and metformin the percentage of patients achieving hba1c greater than 8% after 4 years of initiation of therapy 9 out of 10 patients on metformin have a hba1c greater than 8% and 7 out of 10 on the combination of sulfonylurea and metformin have a a1c level of greater than 8%. So over a period of time as the natural history of the disease progresses oral antidiabetic agents would tend to fail. This slide here demonstrates the limitation of oral combinations for reaching target. It can be seen that with triple oral antidiabetic therapy in type 2 diabetes the use of glimepiride metformin and troglitazone the hba1c over a period of time comes down only from 10.3% to roughly 8.5% still way above the target uh, pro- propagated by the American Diabetes Association so the glucose lowering potential of various diabetes therapies is limited particularly as far as the oral antidiabetic agents are concerned as you can see on the left is demonstrated the various oral antidiabetic agents and on the right is the potential to reduce hba1c it is extremely limited to roughly 1 to 1.5 to 2% on the other hand insulin has an unlimited potential for reducing blood sugar levels whether it is fasting sugar levels or reducing hba1c levels so insulin plays an important role in the management of both type 1 and type 2 diabetes So this is a consensus statement and algorithm for the initiation and adjustment of insulin therapy. As we can, as one can see in this uh, statement on the management of hyperglycemia in type 2 diabetes, the first step is of course lifestyle modification and metformin is the prime drug which is used as an oral anti-diabetic agent in the treatment of type 2 diabetes. And additional therapy if you can notice insulin forms an important part of the step 2 or additional therapy where it can be used straight after the failure of metformin to control diabetes and it has potential to reduce hba1c by 1.5 to 2.5%. So the paradigms have changed and one is moving towards early insulin treatment uh, where uh, uh, before the oral agents fail one can initiate insulin earlier uh before one can go to combinations of 3 to 4 and oral antidiabetic agents so there is a definite role for the early insulin treatment in type 2 diabetes and there is a rationale for this the use of early insulin in type 2 diabetes majority of the patients remain poorly controlled with oral antidiabetic agents and adding insulin therapy can help correct insulin resistance and impaired insulin secretion it is proven to be safe and effective there is no case of insulin failure so to say because any dose is acceptable in the control of blood sugar levels and insulin therapy earlier in the course of disease may preserve beta cell function and improve long term glycemic control and therefore it has an important role in early treatment of type 2 diabetes so when does one start insulin in type 2 diabetes as we have said in a previous slide it can be started at step 2 after the failure of the first oral antidiabetic agent and of course the patient would be on lifestyle modification failure of oral antidiabetic agents whether in monotherapy or in combination and fasting sugar levels of greater than 140 mg or post prandial greater than 180 mg or an hba1c of greater than 7.5% would be an indication for the use of insulin The International Diabetes Federation guidelines on the use of insulin in the management of type 2 diabetes I shall just read out a brief uh, comment from that report the in it is said that initiate insulin therapy before poor glucose control develops generally when dcct aligned hba1c has deteriorated to greater than 7.5% on maximum oral agents so it's an early role that insulin has to play in the treatment of type 2 diabetes and the very fact that insulin has an important role can be judged from this slide this is one of the earlier patients who, tr- who was treated with insulin a type 1 diabetic obviously and this is from the book the discovery of insulin by bliss who is a famous author on the history of insulin and history of diabetes you can see that this little patient who was cachectic and uh, emaciated after treatment turned out to be a healthy young child so the benefits of insulin are beyond just simple glucose control it reduces glucotoxicity it reduces lipotoxicity it reverses insulin resistance preserves beta cell function improves lipid profile 
corrects endothelial dysfunction. It has an anti-inflammatory role and possesses antiplatelet effect and improves the quality of life. Therefore, apart from simple reduction in blood glucose level, insulin has a plethora of actions which are beneficial to the treatment of a diabetic patient. So we shall next come to human insulin. We know that we discussed in the beginning that the initial insulins that were available were bovine and porcine insulins, but they had impurities and they resulted in allergic reactions and the formation of antibodies. And that has prompted the discovery of human insulin, which is produced by recombinant DNA technology. And recombinant DNA technology is also known as genetic engineering. In this technology, the gene expressing human insulin is incorporated in a known chromosomal DNA called plasmid. Then the plasmid is introduced into a microorganism like yeasts and bacteria. And the gene multiplies along with the multiplication of the organism's genome and insulin is expressed. After insulin is extracted, it is subjected to purification processes and the monocomponent insulin is obtained. This is a mere demonstration of the technology, the recombinant DNA technology. And the various organisms which have been used for the, uh, for the synthesis of insulin include Saccharomyces or E. coli. And recombinant DNA uh, insulin was first introduced in the 1980s, which replaced the animal-derived preparations that we were alluding to earlier. Now, a word or two about the subcutaneous ins administration of insulin. As you can see, insulin is a hexamer. It, uh, when it is injected into the subcutaneous site, these hexamer molecules, they uh, dissociate and form uh, dimers and then monomers and ultimately are absorbed into the circulation. Therefore, there is a time lag between the injection of insulin and the action of insulin because these insulin molecules until they enter the circulation and act at the level of the liver or at the level of the peripheral tissues where it causes reduction in blood glucose levels. Various conventional human insulin. And this is a drawback. So the insulins are of two types, the short-acting uh, regular human insulin. In short, I've labeled it as RHI. And the intermediate-acting insulins or NPH, which we are familiar with. And the premix insulins, which is a combination of the short-acting and the intermediate-acting insulin, which is called premix insulin or biphasic insulins. Now, a couple of slides on the pharmaco kinetics and the pharmacodynamics. We have uh, various, this is a classification, the various types of insulins available as of today. We have the rapid acting insulins, which are Lyspro and Aspart. These are the two commonly used rapid acting insulin analogs. These are the modern insulins or the ultra short acting or as they are called rapid acting insulins. There are three uh, criteria which are going to be discussed in these slides. One is the onset of action after injection. How many hours does it take for the action to start? What is the peak action and what is the duration of action? And insulin Lyspro and Aspart have a very quick onset of action, have a short peak action and a shorter duration of action. So the advantage of the rapid acting, rapid acting insulin analogs is that they don't have to be given very very much in advance of the meal. They can be given within five minutes of taking a meal. They control postprandial levels very well because they act. They have a peak which is uh, earlier than the regular short-acting insulin. And the duration of action being short, they don't have a tail effect and they don't cause interprandial hypoglycemia. So this is a dramatic advantage, the use of rapid-acting insulin analogs. The short-acting insulin are the conventional insulin or the so-called earlier it used to be called soluble insulin or regular insulin. It has an onset of action in about an hour's time, a peak action in 2 to 4 hours and a duration of action of 6 to 8 hours. Then we come to the intermediate acting insulins. Two familiar uh, insulins are the NPH insulin and Lente insulin which are similar in their duration peak and onset of action and if you see the duration of action is roughly 18 to 24 hours but they have a peak effect at 6 to 12 hours and this peak effect of NPH and Lente insulin is responsible for hypoglycemia in uh, uh, most patients with uh, who are treated with these forms of insulin and this is the reason why with the shortcomings of short acting insulin and intermediate acting insulins uh, the discovery of the rapid acting insulin analogs and the long acting insulin analogs have gone a long way in uh, overcoming these shortcomings of the two regular insulins available. The long acting insulin analogs include Glargine, which is known popularly as Lantus, and Detimir, which is known as Levimir. They have a flat action profile. This is a big advantage of these insulins. They have a flat action profile and they act for roughly 24 hours, so they need to be given once a day. 
so these are the peakless insulin so to say they have a onset of action of roughly two to three hours a uh, peak action which is negligible the peak activity of between three and eight hours and 24 hours or more of uh, uh, duration of action thus resulting in a once a day insulin uh, for the first time so overall the time action profile is the lowering of blood glucose versus the time post injection so the three characteristics that we uh, uh, have seen in the previous slide of course is the time to onset of action the timing and duration of the peak activity of insulin and the total duration of action uh, we shall go through some of these uh, kinetics uh, we have gone through this slide uh, uh, a couple of slides ago so i shall skip this slide here but coming now to human act rapid or the regular or soluble insulin we know that it acts uh, onset of action is within half an hour maximum action is between one and a half to three hours and duration of action is approximately seven to eight hours and this is the human act rapid molecule demonstrated here on this slide and the drawback of this insulin which prompted the discovery of the short acting insulin newer insulin analogs was the fact that it took a little while so the patient had to inject the insulin about half an hour before taking the meal and this duration of action of six to eight hours or seven to eight hours was responsible for between meal hypoglycemia so uh, between breakfast and lunch for instance this action of insulin prolonged action of insulin resulted in hypoglycemia in the middle of the morning or in the evening so that was the reason why the newer insulin analogs were discovered this is the action profile of human insulatad or uh, long intermediate acting insulin onset of action within one and a half to two hours a maximum action between four to eight hours and this is the period where hypoglycemia occur most often this occurs particularly when this insulin is injected before dinner or after dinner causing nocturnal hypoglycemia in most patients with diabetes this is a action profile of the premixed insulin or the biphasic insulins which is a combination for instance in human mixed at 3070 of 30% short acting insulin and 70% long acting insulin so this is a combined action profile of the two insulins uh, when they are injected together so a word or two about what is the somogi phenomena and the dawn phenomena two phenomena which are associated with the use of insulin somogi phenomena as you are all well aware is the fact that the blood sugar drops to the norm uh, to a low level uh, below normal causing hypoglycemia in the middle of the night this occurs most often when insulatad is used in the night before dinner or after dinner and as a consequence the blood uh, the body liberates blood glucose from its sources particularly within the liver and the early morning sugar when you check in the morning is high so this is a false elevation in response to a hypoglycemia which uh, which occurred in the night and the treatment for this is reduction in the nighttime dose of insulin this is what is called the somogi phenomena and the second phenomena is what is called the dawn phenomena where because of the counter regulatory hormones which are secreted in the middle of the night at 3 o'clock in the morning early in the morning the blood glucose levels are elevated and they remain elevated until early in the morning so when you check your fasting sugar you find that the fasting blood sugar is elevated so this has to be differentiated from the somogi phenomena where at 3 o'clock the blood sugar levels are lower than uh, in the dawn phenomena where they are much higher so it quite often when a patient is on insulin therapy we tell the patients to check the sugar at 3 o'clock in the morning to distinguish between the somogi phenomena and the dawn phenomena because the treatment of the dawn phenomena is an increase in the nighttime dose of insulin and treatment of the somogi phenomena is a reduction in the nighttime dose of insulin now we shall come to the modern insulins uh, we have discussed the conventional insulins or the human insulins such as uh, actrapid insulatad mixtard etc now we shall talk a few words about uh, the modern insulins or the insulin analogs the newer types of insulin included the rapid acting insulins which we have uh, spoken about a little earlier lispro and uh, aspart insulin popularly known as humalog and uh, novo rapid and uh, the long acting insulins which are called uh, lantus or glargine and uh, detimer or levimer insulin and a combination of the two the rapid acting and the long acting rapid acting with an intermediate acting component for a premixed insulin so i shall skip this slide because this is a repetition of uh, some of the stuff that we've already discussed in the previous slides 
So coming now to the limitations of soluble insulin, we have uh, discussed this earlier, but just to amplify the fact that the there is sub.